Now, I'm not saying that people from Gobekli Tepe brought that idea to the Americas. I suspect it more likely the other way around, actually. Um, but uh, wh what I'm saying is that there appears to be an iconographic connection between the two sites, which is not explained by current theories of archaeology. The Indus Valley civilization, nobody actually knew that it existed until it was accidentally discovered while a railway was built. Then they found that this culture had had a language, a fully developed written script. It's about 5,000 years old, but there isn't a single Rosetta Stone that enables us to translate that script into any more recent language. If you wish to pass information to a distant future, if you wish it to be preserved, you wouldn't be smart to just write it down. Welcome to the mysterious and ancient city of Mohenjo-Daro, one of the largest settlements of the Indus Valley civilization and a marvel of prehistoric urban planning buried deep in today's Pakistan. Since the discovery of the Indus Valley civilization, we have to accept that civilization in, in India is at least 5,000 years old. Now, let's unravel the secrets of this place, explore its sophisticated drainage systems, the iconic Great Bath, and decode what secrets might have existed in this magnificent city over 4,000 years ago. I want to know what else is going to be found that hasn't been investigated yet at all. We're just touching the edge of a huge mystery. Mohenjo-Daro, situated in the Sindh province of Pakistan, is a key archaeological site from the Indus Valley Civilization, also known as the Harappan Civilization. Its name, translating to Mound of the Dead in Sindhi, hints at the mysteries buried within this ancient city, offering a unique glimpse into one of the world's earliest urban societies. The site was discovered in 1922 during a broader archaeological survey of the Indian subcontinent conducted by the Archaeological Survey of India. Rakaldas Bandyopadhyay, known as R.D. Banerjee, stumbled upon what he initially thought was a Buddhist stupa in the Larkana district. Further investigation revealed the ruins of an ancient city predating any known Buddhist settlements, marked by sophisticated urban features like baked brick structures. They found that there were these actually very, very sophisticated, very complex mud, mud brick structures on a very large scale. Major excavations kicked off in 1924 under Sir John Marshall, the then Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, and his deputy, Ernest McKay. Their efforts unveiled an advanced city with a well-planned layout Efficient drainage systems, brick houses, granaries, and public baths, all indicating a highly organized society. The excavation methods were quite methodical for the time, involving grid-based trench digging, which allowed for a clearer understanding of the city's layout. Marshall also emphasized the use of photography and meticulous on-site notes to document the findings accurately. Among the most remarkable discoveries was the Great Bath, suggesting the site's use for ritualistic or ceremonial purposes alongside a sophisticated sewage system that highlighted the city's advanced urban planning and sanitation awareness. Post-1947 partition of India, Mohenjo-Daro became part of Pakistan, and new excavation phases were led in the 1950s and 1960s by Pakistani archaeologist Dr. Ahmad Hassan Dani. His work helped uncover lower layers of the city and explore residential areas that had not been previously excavated. There's a, a lost civilization which is now accepted by archaeology within relatively recent memory, and that's the Indus Valley civilization. These later excavations focused more on understanding the daily lives of the inhabitants, with numerous artifacts such as pottery, tools, and ornaments providing insights into their daily activities, trade practices, and cultural aspects. As archaeological techniques evolved, later excavations at Mohenjo-Daro incorporated modern methods including stratigraphic analysis, which aided in more accurately dating the city's layers. There was also a significant emphasis on using refined conservation techniques to preserve delicate artifacts and building materials exposed during the digs. From the 1970s onwards, efforts predominantly shifted towards preserving the integrity of the site as it faced threats from salinity, waterlogging, and deterioration of materials. In recognition of its value and the need for protection, Mohenjo-Daro was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1980, which helped attract international attention and funding aimed at preserving and protecting this ancient window into early urban life. Continuing from the intriguing discoveries and preservation efforts, the urban layout and architecture of Mohenjo-Daro are indeed remarkable. 
reflecting a level of sophistication and scale that's astounding for its time period, around 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. As a critical part of the ancient Indus Valley civilization, this city offers profound insights into the early techniques of urban planning and architecture that have stood the test of time. Mohenjo-daro spanned at least one and a half square kilometers, with some estimates suggesting it might have covered over five square kilometers at its peak, making it one of the largest cities of its time. The city was meticulously planned with a grid system, dividing it into a lower town and a citadel area. Streets running north-south and east-west sliced the city into well-organized blocks, demonstrating the urban planner's keen grasp of design principles. Residential blocks were designed with precision to ensure uniform appearance from the outside and direct access to street-side drainage, reflecting a controlled approach to urban development and adherence to municipal regulations. Is knowledge preserved and passed down through the ages? Yes, I think it is. The city's drainage system was extraordinarily advanced for its era. Each house was connected to a street-side drainage channel through individual drainage pits, a setup that showcases early mastery in sanitary engineering. These drains, constructed from baked brick and gypsum mortar, included manholes at intervals for maintenance, features that would not be out of place in a modern city. The buildings of Mohenjo-daro were primarily built using sun-dried and fired mud brick. Baked bricks were particularly used for constructing bath and drainage structures to better withstand moisture. The architectural variety within the city was notable, with homes ranging from small single-room dwellings to large multi-storied buildings, indicating a society with socio-economic diversity. A typical house featured a courtyard surrounded by rooms, providing light and air to living spaces, with some houses boasting two or even three stories. The standardization in brick size, typically measuring 7 by 14 by 28 centimeters, suggests there was a centralized system for the production and distribution of building materials. Most materials for construction were likely sourced locally, given the abundance of clay in the Indus region, ideal for brickmaking. However, special items like the large stones used in some public buildings might have been sourced from further away and transported to the site. When we compare the urban planning and architectural sophistication of Mohenjo-daro with that of ancient Egypt during the same period, a fascinating picture emerges. While the Egyptians focused more on monumental structures like pyramids, constructed from large stone blocks quarried from distant locations such as Tura and Aswan, the people of Mohenjo-daro excelled in creating a functional urban landscape that prioritized civic amenities and residential comfort, Building on the sophisticated urban planning and architecture of Mohenjo-daro, the archaeological site is also renowned for some extraordinary artifacts that shed light on the cultural and technological advancements of the Indus Valley civilization. We're going to see more physical evidence for this, more as time goes by. The dancing girl is a captivating bronze figurine, merely 10.5 centimeters tall, capturing a young girl in a dynamic pose with one hand on her hip and the other casually dangling at her side. The level of detail in the figurine is remarkable, showing off intricate jewellery and a detailed hairstyle that points to a highly sophisticated sense of aesthetics and craftsmanship. This small statue is not just a piece of art. It highlights the advanced metalworking skills of the time, being one of the few metal artifacts discovered at Mohenjo-daro. Another significant find is the so-called Priest King statue, a small steatite sculpture standing about 17 and a half centimeters high. It depicts a male figure seated, adorned in an intricately engraved robe and wearing a fillet around his head, which might have once held a feather or other decoration. The sculpture's serene expression and the precision of its beard trimming suggest meticulous grooming and possibly a high social or religious status. Some scholars believe this figure might symbolize an idealized form of leadership or divine authority, integrating both political and religious power, though it may not represent a specific individual. Perhaps the most architecturally impressive discovery at Mohenjo-daro is the Great Bath. Located centrally on the Citadel Mound, this large pool measures roughly 12 meters by 7 meters and is about 2.4 meters deep. It's constructed from finely fitted bricks sealed with a layer of natural tar, making it waterproof, an advanced construction technique for the time. The Great Bath is believed to have been used for ritual purification rites, reflecting the civic and religious practices of the Indus people. 
The structure was ingeniously fed by a well, and an adjacent drain allowed for the emptying and cleaning of the bath, indicating a sophisticated management of water resources. Comparing the Great Bath with Roman baths brings interesting insights. Like Mohenjo-Daro's bath, Roman baths were central to social and religious life, going beyond mere hygiene to serve as gathering places for social interaction and ritual practices. However, Roman baths were typically more complex, featuring varied temperatures across different rooms and incorporating technologies like steam baths and underfloor heating, showing different scales and advancements in engineering. An intriguing theory related to Mohenjo-Daro's significance within the Indus Valley civilization is the hydraulic hypothesis, which suggests that the city served as a religious center coordinating the management of an extensive system of irrigation canals. This hypothesis proposes that the city's leadership wielded both political and religious authority, crucial for managing the water resources vital for agriculture in the arid environment. It's just that we still haven't explored in India. I don't know why, for what reason, we stopped the exploration, you know, after the discovery of Dwarka. Even that wasn't fully explored, I feel. And there is a lot more that can be done. So Graham Hancock did do a lot of uh, good work in uh, finding out some of these, um, uh, you know, lost arcs of civilization, you know, along our coast. But uh, that uh, being said, you know, there's also an evolution in the uh, mindset of humanity. Imagine uncovering an ancient masterpiece so intricate and grand that it defies modern understanding. Today, we dive deep into the Ajanta Caves in India, a breathtaking collection of 30 rock-cut monuments carved with such precision that it seems impossible they were created without modern machinery. How did ancient artisans achieve such perfection? Join us as we unravel the mysteries of these incredible caves and explore the techniques that challenge everything we know about ancient engineering and artistry. The Ajanta Caves nestled in the Western Ghats of Maharashtra, India, are a stunning collection of rock-cut monuments dating from the 2nd century BCE to about 480 CE. Renowned for their exquisite paintings and sculptures, these caves are considered masterpieces of Buddhist religious art. They were discovered in 1819 by John Smith, a British cavalry officer, who stumbled upon the caves while hunting tigers. As he entered one of the caves, he found a magnificent complex adorned with intricate carvings and vivid frescoes. Smith's serendipitous discovery brought the caves to international attention, sparking extensive archaeological studies and conservation efforts. The Ajanta Caves consist of 30 caves, each serving as a monastery or a temple for Buddhist monks. These caves were meticulously excavated from a horseshoe-shaped cliff along the Waghora River, using the natural rock formations to create an elaborate architectural ensemble. The effort involved in creating these structures is truly astounding, reflecting a blend of artistic vision and engineering prowess. The walls and ceilings of the Ajanta Caves are adorned with murals depicting various Jataka tales, stories about the previous lives of the Buddha. These paintings illustrate scenes from the Buddha's life, his teachings and Buddhist cosmology. The use of vibrant colors, intricate details and expressive figures showcases the high artistic standards of the period. The murals not only serve a decorative purpose, but also provide educational insights into Buddhist philosophy and morals. In addition to the paintings, the caves feature numerous sculptures, including life-size statues of the Buddha, Bodhisattvas and other religious figures. These sculptures are intricately carved, capturing delicate expressions and detailed features. The craftsmanship displayed in these sculptures is a testament to the skill and dedication of the artists who created them. Each figure is rendered with a profound sense of grace and serenity, embodying the spiritual ideals of Buddhism. These caves can be divided into two main groups based on their construction periods. The earlier phase, dating from the 2nd century BCE to the 1st century CE, consists of simpler cave structures with less elaborate decoration. In contrast, the later phase from the 5th century CE features more complex and intricately decorated caves, reflecting the evolution of artistic and architectural techniques over several centuries. Chaitya halls are large, vaulted spaces designed for congregational worship, each typically housing a stupa at one end. The most notable Chaitya hall is Cave 26, which contains a grand stupa and a large reclining Buddha statue representing his Parinirvana, or final nirvana after death. This cave is distinguished by its elaborate carvings and the sheer scale of its main chamber. 
which measures approximately 25 meters in length, 15 meters in width, and 11 meters in height. The stupa itself is a prominent feature, designed to inspire reverence and devotion among worshippers. Viharas are rectangular halls used as living quarters for monks, with individual cells cut into the walls for sleeping and meditation. These structures often include central pillars supporting the roof and elaborately carved entrances. Cave 1, a vihara, is famous for its magnificent murals depicting the life of the Buddha and other religious themes. This cave measures about 35 meters in length, 20 meters in width, and 15 meters in height, and includes several intricately decorated pillars and a sanctum with a seated Buddha. The Ajanta caves are filled with decorative elements such as pillars, reliefs, and intricate facades, these elements are not only aesthetically pleasing, but also reflect the religious and cultural themes prevalent during the time of their creation. The detailed carvings often depict scenes from the Jataka tales, which are stories about the previous lives of the Buddha, as well as various deities and symbolic motifs. The Ajanta caves were carved out of the volcanic basalt rock of the Deccan Plateau. The size and weight of the stone blocks used in the construction vary greatly, with some of the larger sculptures and architectural features weighing several tons. The basalt rock was quarried using simple tools such as chisels, hammers and picks. The process involved cutting grooves into the rock face and then carefully removing the stone blocks. This method allowed the artists and craftsmen to work directly on the rock face, carving the caves and sculptures in situ. The precision required to create these detailed carvings was achieved through meticulous planning and execution highlighting the advanced skills of the ancient artisans. Since the caves were carved directly into the cliff face, there was minimal need for transporting large stone blocks over long distances. However, moving smaller stones and debris out of the caves would have required significant manual labor. Workers likely used baskets, sledges, and simple pulleys to remove the excavated material. The construction process was labor-intensive and required the coordinated efforts of many individuals over several years, the excavation of the Ajanta Caves involved the removal of an enormous volume of basalt rock. It is estimated that to create these elaborate cave structures, approximately 200,000 to a quarter million cubic meters of rock were removed. This massive excavation required coordinated efforts over several centuries, reflecting the dedication and skill of the craftsmen and laborers. One theory about the disposal of the excavated materials suggests that the debris was dumped into the Waghora River, which flows beneath the cliffs. The river would have carried away the smaller fragments, while the larger pieces might have been used to create terraces or platforms around the cave complex, aiding in construction and providing support for scaffolding. This natural disposal method would have helped manage the vast quantities of waste material generated during the excavation process. An interesting comparison can be made between the Ajanta Caves and the Ellora Caves, also located in Maharashtra. Both are rock-cut cave complexes, but while Ajanta primarily focuses on Buddhist themes, Ellora features a mix of Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain monuments. The Kailasa Temple at Ellora, a monolithic rock excavation, is particularly noteworthy. Like Ajanta, the amount of rock removed at Ellora is staggering, estimated to be about 200,000 tons. This comparison highlights the shared techniques and grand scale of ancient Indian rock-cut architecture, illustrating the impressive engineering and artistic capabilities of the time. The archaeological excavations and studies at the Ajanta Caves have unearthed a wealth of artifacts and inscriptions, providing valuable insights into the lives of the Buddhist monks who lived and worshipped there. These discoveries paint a vivid picture of the social, economic and religious dynamics of the period, among the most significant findings are the inscriptions written in ancient scripts, such as Brahmi and Devanagari. These inscriptions are a treasure trove of historical information, revealing details about the patrons who funded the construction of the caves. Notable patrons included kings, merchants and monks, who sought to gain religious merit and ensure the propagation of Buddhist teachings. For example, an inscription in Cave 26 mentions a local king, Upendragupta, who sponsored the construction of several caves. These inscriptions highlight the involvement of various social classes in the creation of the caves and provide dates and context for the construction phases. Various artifacts, including pottery, tools and coins, have also been discovered at the site. Pottery shards found at Ajanta suggest that the monks engaged in everyday activities such as cooking and storage. 
tools discovered include chisels and hammers made from iron, which were used for carving the intricate sculptures and architectural elements. Coins from different periods provide evidence of the trade and economic activities that took place in the region, reflecting the prosperity and connectivity of the area. An interesting comparison can be made between the Ajanta Caves and the Magao Caves in China, also known as the Caves of the Thousand Buddhas. Both sites are significant for their extensive collections of Buddhist art and their roles as important centers of pilgrimage and monastic life. The Mogao Caves, located near Dunhuang on the ancient Silk Road, were carved into the cliffs of the Gobi Desert and contain a vast array of murals, sculptures and manuscripts dating from the 4th to the 14th centuries. While Ajanta is renowned for its vibrant murals and intricate sculptures, the Mogao Caves are noted for their extensive manuscript collections including the famous Diamond Sutra, one of the oldest printed books in the world. Both sites reflect the spread and adaptation of Buddhism across different cultures and geographies, showcasing the diverse artistic and religious expressions within the Buddhist tradition. The comparison highlights the shared heritage of Buddhist art and the unique regional variations that developed over time. I think that the city of Tiwanaku is one of the most mysterious sites in the world. In a way, it's the New World equivalent of Giza. It's a site about which there are far more questions than answers. All these names that are given to structures at Tiwanaku are entirely arbitrary because we know nothing about the people who built Tiwanaku. Imagine a civilization capable of constructing massive stone structures with such precision that even modern engineers are left baffled. God knows how anybody got it up there at 14,000 feet above sea. I can even breathe at 14,000 feet above sea level. Welcome to Tiwanaku and Puma Punku, ancient sites near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia that have sparked intense debate and fascination. Were the Tiwanaku people wielders of advanced technology, or is there something more mysterious at play in these enigmatic ruins? Tiwanaku is a very controversial site, and archaeologists would like it not to be much more than 2,000 years old. Dive into the mysteries of these ancient marvels and explore the theories that challenge our understanding of pre-Columbian history. Tiwanaku is an ancient archaeological site situated near Lake Titicaca in western Bolivia. This site was the heart of the Tiwanaku Empire, a highly advanced civilization that thrived between 300 AD and 1000 AD. Renowned for their impressive architectural and engineering achievements, the Tiwanaku people developed intricate agricultural systems and maintained extensive trade networks that stretched across South America. Their civilization is considered one of the most significant pre-Columbian cultures in the region, leaving a legacy that continues to captivate historians and archaeologists. The handiwork of humans is clearly evident uh, in this site. The first European accounts of Tiwanaku came from Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. Chroniclers like Pedro Chiesa de Leon provided early descriptions of the monumental ruins they encountered, speculating about the origins of these impressive structures. These initial reports highlighted the grandeur and mystery of Tiwanaku, sparking curiosity and interest in the site for centuries to come. In the late 19th century, the first detailed studies of Tiwanaku began to take shape. American archaeologist and diplomat Ephraim George Squire visited the site in 877, meticulously documenting the ruins through detailed descriptions and drawings. His work provided valuable insights into the architectural complexity of Tiwanaku. Around the same time, French explorer Charles Wiener also documented the site, contributing further to the growing body of knowledge about this ancient civilization. These early efforts laid the foundation for ongoing research, ensuring that Tiwanaku remains a vital subject of archaeological study and discovery. We're going to see more physical evidence for this, more as time goes by. The key structures and features of Tiwanaku are as fascinating as they are monumental. One of the most significant structures at the site is the Akapana Pyramid, this large, terraced mound stands approximately 16 and a half meter high and spans a base area of around 200 meters by 250 meters. The pyramid's design is thought to emulate a sacred mountain, reflecting the religious and cultural importance placed on such natural formations. To prevent water damage and erosion, a sophisticated drainage system was integrated into the pyramid. 
This system included a network of stone-lined channels and underground conduits that efficiently diverted rainwater away from the structure, showcasing the advanced engineering skills of the Tiwanaku people. The pyramid's terraces were constructed using a combination of large stone blocks and compacted earth. The stone blocks were precisely cut and fitted together without the use of mortar, demonstrating the builder's high level of craftsmanship. Another remarkable feature at Tiwanaku is the Kalasaya Complex, a large rectangular enclosure surrounded by high stone walls. The enclosure measures approximately 130 meters by 120 meters. Within the Kalasaya Complex stands the famous Gateway of the Sun, a massive monolithic archway carved from a single block of andesite stone. The Gateway of the Sun is about 3 meters high and 4 meters wide, with an estimated weight of 10 tons. The intricate carvings on the gateway include depictions of deities and astronomical symbols believed to be related to the Tiwanaku calendar and cosmology. These carvings highlight the Tiwanaku people's advanced understanding of astronomy and their integration of celestial events into their religious practices. There's curious astronomical alignments at Tiwanaku. The site was aligned to the summer solstice in 10,500 BC. Equally impressive is the semi-subterranean temple, an imposing sunken courtyard measuring about 28 and a half meters by 26 meters. One of the most distinctive features of this temple is the collection of carved stone heads embedded in its walls. These heads protrude from the walls at various heights and angles, representing a diverse array of facial features. Some scholars suggest that these heads symbolize different ethnic groups or important individuals, reflecting the Tiwanaku civilization's diversity and social complexity. Similarly fascinating is Puma Punku, another marvel of the Tiwanaku civilization. Puma Punku was known to Spanish explorers in the 16th century, just like the main Tiwanaku site. However, it wasn't until the 20th century that modern archaeological efforts brought significant scholarly attention to Puma Punku. Systematic excavations and studies began in earnest in the mid-20th century, revealing the site's unique architectural style and the mysterious techniques used in its construction. The stone blocks at Puma Punku are particularly renowned for their extraordinary precision. The primary materials used are andesite and sandstone, both known for their durability and hardness. The stones are cut with such exactitude that the joints between them are virtually invisible, so precise that even a razor blade cannot fit between the stones. The exact methods used to cut and shape the stones at Puma Punku remain a topic of debate and fascination. Several theories have been proposed to explain the precision and complexity of the stonework. One prevalent theory is that the Tiwanaku people used metal tools made from bronze or copper alloys. These metals are capable of cutting softer stones, but the hardness of andesite presents a significant challenge. However, evidence of bronze and copper tools at other Tiwanaku sites supports this theory. Some stones show marks consistent with the use of chisels or other cutting tools, suggesting that the builders had access to and effectively utilized metal tools. Another theory posits the use of abrasive materials like sand and water to cut and shape the stones. This technique involves rubbing sand and water against the stone's surface to gradually wear it down, potentially explaining the smooth surfaces and precise angles observed at Puma Punku. Large grinding stones could have been used to smooth and polish the stone surfaces after the initial cutting, further contributing to the precise fit of the blocks. Some researchers propose that the Tiwanaku civilization possessed advanced technologies or techniques that have since been lost. This theory suggests they might have had knowledge of sophisticated methods or tools that we do not fully understand today. A fringe theory, popularized by some alternative history proponents, suggests that extraterrestrial beings assisted the Tiwanaku people in constructing Puma Punku. Some people find, think that the answer is, is extraterrestrial visitors. <laughs> I don't think that's the answer, but yeah. who knows? While this theory captures the imagination, it is not supported by mainstream archaeology and remains speculative. One of the most iconic features of Puma Punku is the presence of H-shaped blocks. These blocks are a testament to the advanced engineering and architectural skills of the Tiwanaku civilization. The H-shaped blocks interlock in a modular fashion, suggesting they were designed to fit together in a specific configuration. This modularity indicates a highly planned and sophisticated approach to construction. The H-blocks vary in size, but many are approximately one meter high and wide, with a depth of about half a meter. Each block weighs several tons, with some of the largest estimated to weigh over 10 tons. 
Creating these H-blocks would have required advanced stone cutting techniques. The precise angles and smooth surfaces indicate a high degree of craftsmanship, pointing to the use of advanced tools or methods. Another fascinating aspect of Puma Punku is the transportation of its massive stone blocks. Some of these blocks weigh over 100 tons and were transported from quarries located several kilometers away. One widely accepted theory is that the Tiwanaku people used wooden sleds to transport the large stone blocks. These sleds could have been pulled by large groups of workers, leveraging human muscle power. The use of log rollers beneath the sleds could have facilitated the movement of the heavy stones. As the sled moved forward, workers would have placed logs in front of it, continuously rolling the sled over the logs. Given the absence of large domesticated draft animals in the region during that period, it is more likely that large teams of workers, organized and coordinated, performed the task using simple machines like levers and inclined planes to aid in lifting and moving the massive stones. The Tiwanaku civilization likely mobilized a substantial labor force with coordinated efforts similar to those used in other ancient construction projects, such as the building of the Egyptian pyramids. Some theories propose that Lake Titicaca, which was larger and closer to the site during the time of the Tiwanaku civilization, could have been used to transport the stones by rafts. This method would have involved floating the stones across the lake before moving them overland for the final leg of the journey. The use of earthen ramps is another plausible theory. Ramps could have been built to gradually elevate the stones to their intended positions. This method would have required significant labor and planning, but is consistent with techniques used by other ancient civilizations. Simple machines such as levers and pulleys could have been employed to lift and position the stones. These tools, combined with ramps, would have allowed the Tiwanaku builders to achieve the precise placement required for their structures. The precision stonework at Puma Punku is often compared to the masonry of the Egyptian pyramids, particularly the Great Pyramid of Giza. Constructed around 2580 to 2560 BCE, the Great Pyramid consists of millions of limestone blocks, some weighing up to 80 tons. The precision of the blocks and the alignment of the pyramid with celestial bodies reflect advanced engineering and architectural knowledge. Similar to the Great Pyramid, Puma Punku's stone blocks are meticulously cut and perfectly fitted together. The precision seen in both sites suggests a high level of planning and execution, pointing to the possibility that both civilizations had advanced knowledge of construction techniques and tools, although the exact methods remain debated. And while we're on the subject of Southeast Asia, where something very interesting has recently rocked the world of archaeology, it's another Gobekli Tepe, if you like. It is, it is a piece of hard evidence that is rewriting history. He says it's a strong case, but not an easy case. We're up against the world's belief. Nan Madol, often dubbed the Venice of the Pacific, is a captivating archaeological site located off the southeast coast of Pohnpei in the Federated States of Micronesia. This complex of artificial islands linked by a network of canals stands as a testament to the engineering marvel of ancient Pacific Island civilization. The historical context and discovery of Nan Madol stretch through several phases, from early European documentation to extensive scientific studies, unraveling the mysteries of this mysterious site. The first known European to document Nan Madol was Fyodor Litka, a Russian navigator and explorer. During his 1828 voyage in the Pacific, part of a broader Russian initiative to explore and understand the region, Litka encountered the massive stone ruins on a series of artificial islets. He described them as an engineering feat unparalleled in the Pacific Islands. Nan Madol's location off Pohnpei made it a significant discovery, highlighting a site that reflected extensive knowledge and influence across the Pacific Ocean during that era. The real focus on Nan Madol's archaeological significance began with the German colonial administration's takeover of the Caroline Islands. This period marked the start of more focused archaeological attention directed toward the site. Throughout the 20th century, numerous archaeologists from various countries, including the United States, Japan and local Micronesian scholars, conducted in-depth investigations. These efforts aim to decode the secrets of the site's construction, its purpose, and the society that built it. Researchers delved into the architecture, 
artifacts, and human remains found across the approximately 92 artificial islets, seeking insights into the social structure, religious practices, and daily life of its past inhabitants. This detailed archaeological work, which began earnestly in the early 1900s, continues into the 21st century, striving to document and preserve this unique cultural heritage site and understand the development of complex societies in the Pacific. In recent years, the Japanese government has stepped in to assist financially with the preservation and study of Nan Madol, recognizing its regional heritage and historical significance. This contribution underscores the site's importance and aids in ongoing research and conservation efforts. Moreover, in 2016, Nan Madol was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, bringing international attention and resources to its preservation efforts. This designation has been pivotal in enhancing the site's management and conservation, ensuring that Nan Madol remains preserved for future generations. The involvement of local scholars and the Pohnpeian community has been crucial in bridging the gap between past and present. Their knowledge of oral histories and traditional practices has enriched the archaeological data, providing a deeper understanding of Nan Madol's historical and cultural context. This local engagement not only supports scientific inquiry, but also ensures that the heritage of Nan Madol continues to be a living part of the community's identity and history. One of the most thought-provoking and mysterious aspects of Nan Madol is the legend surrounding its construction, particularly the origin story of the Sordelur dynasty. According to local Ponpayan folklore, the founders of Nan Madol were two brothers, Olosopa and Olosipa, who came from somewhere in the west or northwest, guided by a flying dragon. These brothers were not just ordinary men but were skilled in sorcery and possessed the mystical ability to command spirits and elements. The brothers initially sought to build an altar on Pompei to worship Nanison, the god of agriculture, by using a massive floating stone brought from another island. After several failed attempts and the death of the elder brother Olosopa, the younger brother Olosipa, succeeded in creating Nan Madol by magically flying in the huge basalt stones and commanding them to stack themselves. This narrative infuses the site with a deep mystical significance, suggesting that the city was more than a political and ceremonial center, but also a place imbued with supernatural power. This legend raises provocative questions about the intersection of mythology and technology in ancient societies. How did such stories influence the construction and organization of Nan Madol? Were these legends an attempt to rationalize the extraordinary engineering feats achieved with the resources and knowledge available at the time? Or do they point to something deeper? Building on our previous discussion of Nan Madol's history, it's equally fascinating to delve into the architectural and engineering feats that define this ancient marvel. Nan Madol's construction not only displays extraordinary prehistoric engineering prowess, but also aligns with the complexities seen in some of the most famous ancient sites worldwide. The design and execution demonstrate a sophisticated knowledge of architecture, logistics, and natural resource management that is impressive even by contemporary standards. The engineering challenges began with establishing a stable foundation directly on coral reefs, a challenging environment due to the soft, unstable substrate and exposure to tidal fluctuations. To overcome these challenges, builders constructed nearly 100 artificial islets across more than 200 acres, meticulously positioning huge stones on the shallow reef to withstand the forces of the ocean. The primary building material was columnar basalt, chosen for its natural, pillar-like formation. The largest of these stones could measure up to 7.5 meters in length and weigh up to 50 tons, roughly the equivalent of a fully loaded tractor trailer or a large modern tank. The total volume of basalt and coral fill used in creating the islets is estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands of cubic meters. Transporting and positioning such immense volumes required not only significant labor but also precise planning. One of the site's greatest mysteries is how these massive basalt logs were moved several kilometers without the use of wheels, a technology not known to exist in prehistoric Micronesian cultures. An interesting theory suggests that the builders might have utilized the buoyant properties of bamboo rafts to float these massive stones across the lagoon, a method that would have alleviated weight issues and provided a feasible means to transport heavy loads across water. 
The construction of Nan Madol shares some intriguing parallels with other monumental projects like the Great Wall of China, which also required adapting construction techniques to challenging environments. Both the Great Wall and Nan Madol showcase the ingenuity of their respective builders in using available materials and innovative methods to overcome environmental challenges. Another fascinating theory about Nan Madol involves the potential use of a natural cement or geopolymer, similar to methods speculated to have been used in the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. While there is no direct evidence for this at Nan Madol, the precision fit of the stones suggests that some form of binding agent might have been employed to secure the structures against the forces of the tide. As previously mentioned, Nan Madol was meticulously planned as a series of approximately 100 artificial islets spread across more than 200 acres of a tidal lagoon. These islets were connected by a network of canals serving dual purposes. They facilitated transportation across the city and acted as defensive barriers against potential invaders. This strategic use of the aquatic environment for defense can be likened to ancient moated structures but executed on a far grander scale. Each islet was clearly differentiated by function, with distinct zones for the elite commoners and ceremonial activities, reflecting a highly stratified society, where social status dictated spatial occupation within the urban layout. The elite's residences were strategically placed to offer both privacy and protection, often located on the more central islets which were better defended and closer to the ceremonial centers. These areas featured larger structures and more elaborate basalt log constructions. The ceremonial islets, particularly those like Nandoas, were the focal points of the city. Nandoas itself is an engineering marvel, featuring walls over 8 meters high and 5 meters thick, constructed entirely from huge basalt logs. These logs were fitted together without mortar, relying on their massive weight and the puzzle-like fit of their hexagonal shapes to create stability. Nan Duas housed the tombs of the Sordala rulers, making it a key place of power and significance. The design of Nan Duas suggests that it served not only as a tomb area, but possibly also as a site for major ceremonial gatherings and the enactment of important rituals, which reinforced the rulers' divine status and their control over society. Comparing Nan Madol with other ancient constructions offers interesting insights. While the Egyptian pyramids were monumental sites built on solid land using a massive workforce and resources from a large centralized state, Nan Madol's construction required ingenious adaptations to a fluid and challenging marine environment. Yet, both sites demonstrate the capacity of ancient societies to mobilize and manage large-scale resources over generations. The strategic use of water in Nan Madol's design is also reminiscent of medieval European castles with moats, which used water as a natural defensive barrier to protect against sieges, albeit in very different contexts. The use of naturally hexagonal columnar basalt at Nan Madol not only facilitated the physical construction process, but also enhanced the structural integrity of the buildings. This choice of material and the method of construction likely contributed to the site's longevity, as these stones interlock naturally, creating a more resilient structure against natural elements, especially in a saltwater environment. Very ancient structures, thousands of years older than archaeologists suppose, may be hiding in plain view. If you have a relatively short time frame uh, to deal with, then searching for a lost civilization becomes much more complex and much more difficult. But if you have a very long time frame to deal with, there's much more material to investigate. The handiwork of humans is clearly evident uh, in this site. Have you ever heard of a civilization that rivaled ancient Egypt, but vanished without a trace? A great civilization that had been destroyed and that had left some survivors who had come to Egypt. Deep in the heart of Africa, which boasts the world's oldest human artifacts, lies the forgotten kingdom of Kerma. These enigmatic people built massive structures called defufas, but their purpose remains a mystery. Join us as we explore the fascinating history. Kerma de Fufa, located near the third cataract of the Nile in what is now northern Sudan, is a significant archaeological site featuring a large mud-brick temple known as the Defufa. This impressive structure dates back to around 2500 to 1500 BCE, standing about 18 meters high with a base measuring approximately 50 meters by 25 meters. 
The term defufa is derived from the Nubian word for mud brick building, reflecting its construction material and technique. The modern archaeological investigation of Kerma began with George Reisner, a Harvard University archaeologist who started his groundbreaking work in 1913. Reisner's discoveries at Kerma reshaped our understanding of this ancient Nubian civilization, uncovering a vast urban center with extensive burial grounds and a wealth of artifacts. I want to know what else is going to be found that hasn't been investigated yet at all. We're just touching the edge of a huge mystery. His findings indicated that Kerma was not just a peripheral settlement, but a major urban center. The artifacts he found, including elaborately decorated pottery, finely crafted statues and gold jewelry, suggested that Kerma was a significant center of artistic and cultural production, rivaling contemporary Egyptian cities in its complexity and wealth. Continuing Reisner's work, Swiss archaeologist Charles Bonnet began his excavations in the 1970s, which further expanded our knowledge of Kerma's sophisticated society. Bonnet's team unearthed royal tombs adorned with offerings such as ebony and ivory, highlighting the wealth and power of Kerma's rulers. The layout of residential areas revealed a well-organized urban planning system with distinct sectors for various social classes, and the discovery of organized grave sites containing human sacrifices suggested complex spiritual beliefs. These practices, possibly revolving around ancestor worship or the divine nature of kingship, are reminiscent of those observed in other ancient civilizations like the Aztecs. I believe that it's worth considering the possibility of a remote common ancestor, which passed down key information that was inherited by later cultures. Kerma's relationship with ancient Egypt provides an intriguing comparison. While both were Nile Valley civilizations, they developed distinct architectural styles and societal structures. Unlike Egypt's hierarchical and theocratic society, evidenced by monumental stone architecture like pyramids, Kerma's use of large mud-brick buildings reflects a possibly more communal and egalitarian social structure. This difference is underscored by the different materials and building techniques, yet both civilizations achieved architectural durability and complexity. I can't help thinking time capsule, that there was an intention to preserve this. A compelling theory about Kerma's rise to prominence centers on its strategic location, which made it a crucial trade hub between sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world. This position likely enabled Kerma to control trade routes, exchanging local goods such as gold, ivory, incense and exotic animal skins for Egyptian grain, wine and linen. This vibrant trade not only brought economic prosperity, but also facilitated cultural exchange, contributing significantly to the city's development. Continuing from the fascinating historical insights into Kerma's development, the architecture displayed in the Defufa is equally captivating and speaks volumes about the ingenuity of ancient Nubian civilization. The Defufa, a massive mud-brick structure that has stood the test of time, remains one of the most enigmatic monuments in African history. Built entirely from mud-bricks, its preservation is particularly impressive considering the vulnerability of the material to erosion. The main structure of the Defufa measures about 50 meters in length and 25 meters in width, rising approximately 18 meters high. This monumental size makes it a dominant feature in the flat landscape of the region, the construction technique involved using local Nile mud mixed with straw, which was then sun-dried. The walls are notably thick, some several meters wide, which not only adds to the building's stability, but also its defensive capabilities. The Defufa's internal structure is divided into three main platforms, each potentially serving different functions. The first platform may have been used for public ceremonies or gatherings, the second for more exclusive rituals or administrative activities, and the topmost platform likely held sanctuaries or spaces reserved for the elite of Kerma society. Adding to its complexity, the Defufa featured external staircases, a rare element in Nubian architecture that facilitated access to its various levels, indicating a sophisticated internal hierarchy. The strategic orientation and placement of the Defufa might have also served astronomical purposes, such as marking solstices or equinoxes, a feature common in other ancient monumental structures across the globe. On the summer solstice, you're going to see the sun rising far to the north of east. Go there on the winter solstice, you're going to see it far to the south of east. 
This architectural giant was not just an isolated structure, it was a central hub for the cultural, political and religious activities of the Kerma culture. Its towering presence, visible for miles around, not only symbolized the authority and centralized power of Kerma's rulers, but likely also served navigational purposes along the Nile. The religious significance of the Defufa cannot be understated. It was likely a place where rituals were performed to ensure the fertility of the land or the prosperity of the people, effectively integrating the community's spiritual life with its leadership. When comparing the Defufa with the ziggurats of ancient Mesopotamia, both structures share similarities in materials and multi-leveled designs. However, while ziggurats were primarily religious temples, the Defufa's design suggests it combined defensive, administrative and ceremonial functions, indicating a nuanced approach to public structures in Nubian society compared to Mesopotamian traditions, where a clearer separation between the sacred and administrative was observed. Turning our attention from the architectural marvels of ancient Nubia to the mysterious landscapes of West Africa, we encounter the enigmatic Senegambian stone circles. These remarkable megalithic sites, distributed across the northwestern edge of Senegal and central Gambia, span a vast area from the River Gambia to the River Saloum, covering about 30,000 square kilometers. Notable sites such as Wasu and Kerbach in the Gambia and Sinengayen in Senegal draw the curious and the scholarly alike. The physical characteristics of these stone circles are as fascinating as their distribution. Each circle comprises between 10 to 24 stones made from laterite, a dense iron-rich rock. These stones, roughly cylindrical and standing about 1 to 2 meters high, are often organized in concentric circles or double circles, creating a striking visual impact on the landscape. The stone circles first came to broader recognition through the accounts of European travelers in the mid-19th century, but it wasn't until the 20th century that systematic archaeological investigations began. Gambian historian Aliu Ebrima Chamjouf played a crucial role in documenting these sites extensively during the mid-1900s, advocating for their preservation. His efforts paved the way for more detailed studies. In the 1970s, significant strides in understanding these formations were made through the work of researchers like Pierre Tilloy. These archaeological excavations helped clarify the chronology and cultural significance of the stone circles, revealing a complex societal structure that had the capacity to coordinate the construction of these monumental works. The discovery of these societal structures reshaped our understanding of the prehistoric cultures of West Africa, indicating advanced social organization and cultural sophistication. Our understanding of prehistory must change. In recognition of their significant cultural value, UNESCO designated the Senegambian stone circles as a World Heritage Site in 2006. This recognition not only highlights their importance on a global scale, but also has spurred increased archaeological interest and conservation efforts. The continued exploration and preservation of these stone circles help ensure that the legacy of West Africa's prehistoric cultures continues to inform and inspire future generations. Archaeological excavations have confirmed that the circles primarily served as burial sites, with human remains often found at the center of these circles, accompanied by various artifacts such as pottery, iron tools and jewelry. These findings indicate a belief in an afterlife and the practice of offering goods to the deceased, highlighting the deep spiritual and cultural dimensions of the societies that built them. And then let's go to Sacsayhuaman uh, in the Sacred Valley near the town of Cusco uh, in Peru, in the High Andes. Incredible megaliths there, which archaeology gives entirely to the Incas, even though the Incas themselves recognized and honored the work of predecessors. Machu Picchu, often called the Lost City of the Incas, is a 15th century Incan citadel nestled in the Andes Mountains of Peru, sitting approximately 2,430 meters above sea level. Perched on a mountain ridge above the Sacred Valley, it lies 80 kilometers northwest of Cusco, the capital of the Inca Empire. Rediscovered by American explorer Hiram Bingham in 1911, Machu Picchu has since become one of the world's most iconic and significant archaeological sites. This article delves into its history, rediscovery, architecture, and the numerous intriguing artifacts and features found there. Machu Picchu was constructed around 1450 during the reign of the Inca Emperor Pachacuti. 
It was abandoned less than a century later, during the Spanish conquest, and remained largely unknown to the outside world until the early 20th century. Unlike other Incan sites, it was not discovered and plundered by the Spanish, which left its structures relatively intact. The exact purpose of Machu Picchu remains a subject of debate among historians and archaeologists. It is thought to have been a royal estate, a religious site, or a combination of both, serving as a retreat for Incan nobility and a ceremonial center. Hiram Bingham, a historian and explorer from Yale University, is credited with bringing Machu Picchu to international attention. In July 1911, guided by local farmers, Bingham reached the overgrown ruins and recognized their historical significance. Bingham's subsequent expeditions in 1912 and 1915, sponsored by Yale University and the National Geographic Society, led to extensive excavation and documentation of the site. Bingham's work at Machu Picchu sparked global interest in Incan culture and the study of ancient civilizations in the Andes. Machu Picchu is renowned for its sophisticated dry stone construction, which involves precisely cut stones fitting together without mortar. This technique, known as ashlar masonry, has withstood centuries of weathering and seismic activity, showcasing the Inca's advanced engineering skills. The site covers approximately 80,000 acres and is divided into two main sectors, the agricultural sector and the urban sector. Machu Picchu's agricultural sector is a marvel of ancient engineering, featuring a series of terraces that were ingeniously used for farming. These terraces not only helped prevent soil erosion, but also maximized the arable land area, allowing the cultivation of various crops such as maize, potatoes and quinoa. The design of these terraces shows a deep understanding of the landscape and an ability to transform the rugged mountain terrain into productive farmland, to support these terraces, the Inca developed an intricate system of aqueducts and channels for irrigation. This sophisticated water management system ensured that the crops received adequate water, even in the challenging environment of the Andes. The aqueducts and channels demonstrate the Inca's advanced engineering skills and their ability to harness and control natural resources effectively. This impressive irrigation system played a crucial role in the success of agriculture at Machu Picchu, supporting the community that lived there. The urban sector of Machu Picchu is a marvel of Incan architecture and engineering, showcasing their advanced techniques in stone masonry and construction. This area includes some of the most significant and well-preserved structures that reveal much about Incan society, religion, and astronomical knowledge. One of the most notable artifacts is the Intihuatana Stone, often referred to as the Hitching Post of the Sun. This carved granite rock used for astronomical observations and ceremonies is precisely aligned with the sun's position during the winter solstice, marking important calendar events. The Intihuatana is carved from a single block of granite weighing several tons, approximately two meters high and one and a half meters wide. The granite was likely quarried from the same mountain ridge or nearby quarries, and the Incas used a combination of manual labor wooden rollers, sledges, and lever systems to transport and position such large stones. The Temple of the Sun is another key structure in Machu Picchu. This semicircular temple is built around a natural rock formation and features windows that align with the sun during solstices, reflecting the Inca's astronomical knowledge and religious practices. The stones used in the Temple of the Sun are finely cut and polished granite blocks, with some weighing up to 20 tons. These stones were sourced from quarries in the surrounding region, likely from the Vilcabamba River area. Human labor, ropes and wooden beams as rollers were used to transport these massive blocks over the steep terrain, requiring sophisticated engineering techniques. Located in the sacred plaza, the Room of the Three Windows features three large trapezoidal windows offering panoramic views of the mountains and the valley. Believed to serve a ceremonial purpose, this structure symbolizes the Inca's connection with their environment. The room of the three windows is constructed with large granite blocks, each weighing several tons. The precise alignment and smooth surfaces of these stones highlight the Inca's advanced masonry skills. The stones were quarried from nearby sources and transported using traditional Incan methods, including sledges, rollers, and coordinated labor forces. The trapezoidal shape of the windows also suggests advanced knowledge of structural stability. An impressive structure within the sacred plaza is the main temple, characterized by its finely cut stones and precise construction. 
It was likely a central place for religious ceremonies and significant events. The main temple consists of large, intricately cut granite blocks, some weighing up to 50 tons. These stones are fitted together without mortar, a technique known as ashlar masonry. The granite blocks were quarried locally and transported using a combination of human labor, ropes and wooden rollers. The precise cutting and fitting of these stones demonstrate the Inca's exceptional craftsmanship and engineering knowledge. Below the Temple of the Sun lies the Royal Tomb, a cave-like structure thought to be a mausoleum for Incan nobility. It features elaborate stone carvings and niches for offerings, indicating its importance. The tomb is carved from natural rock and supplemented with additional granite blocks. The stones used in the tomb and the surrounding structures are smaller than those in the main temples, but are still substantial, weighing several hundred kilograms to a few tons. Stones for the royal tomb were likely sourced from the same local quarries. Transport methods included manual labor and the use of simple machines like levers and rollers to move and position the stones within the tomb's complex. The stones used in Machu Picchu's construction were primarily quarried from the same mountain ridge or nearby sources. The exact techniques employed by the Incas to quarry, transport and position, these massive stones involve a combination of human ingenuity and physical labor. Stones were extracted using simple tools made of harder stones, bronze and wood. The Incas would create fractures in the rock by heating it with fire and then cooling it rapidly with water causing it to crack and making it easier to split. Moving these large stones involved a coordinated effort of laborers using ropes, wooden rollers, sledges and inclined planes. The steep and rugged terrain of Machu Picchu required innovative methods to maneuver the stones, including the use of gravity and leverage. Once at the site, stones were precisely cut and fitted together using ashlar masonry techniques, involving polishing and shaping the stones to fit perfectly without the use of mortar, ensuring structural stability and resistance to earthquakes. Machu Picchu continues to be a focal point of archaeological study and preservation efforts. Its designation as a UNESCO World Heritage Site has helped protect it from the impacts of tourism and environmental degradation. Ongoing research and conservation work aim to preserve its historical integrity and ensure that future generations can appreciate this marvel of Incan engineering and culture. Bingham's excavations and subsequent archaeological work at Machu Picchu have uncovered a wealth of artifacts and structures that provide fascinating insights into Incan society, religion, and daily life. One of the most significant discoveries has been the skeletal remains found at the site. These remains have been analyzed to understand the health, diet, and demographics of Machu Picchu's inhabitants. Interestingly, many of the remains belong to women, suggesting that the site may have housed a significant number of female attendants or priestesses. Various ceramic vessels and pottery shards have also been found throughout Machu Picchu. These artifacts often feature intricate designs and motifs, reflecting the Inca's artistic skills and cultural practices. The ceramics not only served practical purposes, but also held ceremonial significance, indicating the high level of craftsmanship among Incan artisans. Metalwork is another area where the Inca excelled, and tools, ornaments and ceremonial items made from bronze, copper and silver have been discovered at Machu Picchu. These items highlight the Inca's metallurgical expertise and their ability to create both functional tools and decorative objects. The metalwork found at the site underscores the Inca's technological advancements and their appreciation for fine craftsmanship. Textiles were highly valued in Incan society and fragments of finely woven textiles have been uncovered at Machu Picchu. These textiles showcase the advanced techniques and vibrant dyes used by the Inca. The intricate designs and high quality of the textiles often served as indicators of status and wealth, illustrating the social importance of textile production in Incan culture. One of the most intriguing discoveries at Machu Picchu is the quipu, the Incan system of record-keeping using knotted strings. A few examples of quipu have been found at the site, providing valuable information about the administrative and economic activities of the Inca. The quipu system was a sophisticated method of data storage and communication, reflecting the complex organizational structure of the Incan Empire. These discoveries at Machu Picchu have significantly contributed to our understanding of the Inca civilization, revealing a society with advanced knowledge in various fields, from engineering and architecture to art and administration.
The artifacts and remains found at the site continue to shed light on the daily lives and spiritual practices of the Incan people, making Machu Picchu an invaluable window into their world.